I've been trying to Nuzlocke Radical Red for over two years. This video will discuss all features of the game along with my thoughts about them drawn from my own salty experiences. ROM hacks. They've been a huge part of the Pokemon community for years now. I've seen some go as far to say that fan remakes are the main reason their interest in the franchise has been maintained. I was seven years old when Pokemon Red and Blue first released in the UK. Yes. I'm old. And for nearly 25 years now, I have replayed the vanilla games between dozens and hundreds of times each. Maybe some of you can say the same. After all, Pokemon has always incentivized multiple playthroughs, simply down to its core mechanic of catching and using different teams of Pokemon. Gotta catch them all, gotta catch them all. This alone gives Pokemon games as much life as they have. But after a while, like any game, they can still get kind of stale. It's fortunate then that so many incredible original Pokemon ROM hacks exist today. Even if that viewpoint isn't exactly shared by the Pokemon company themselves. Different ROM hacks come with a wide array of offerings. There are difficulty ROM hacks, keeping the core game similar or even identical to its original source game, with the main difference being an increase in the difficulty in Pokemon battles specifically. Sometimes these hacks may even add a larger pool of available Pokemon, move sets, abilities, items, and even mechanics such as Mega Evolution, Physical Special Split, typings that didn't exist during that generation, and a selection of convenience of life features from more modern Pokemon games. And then you've got Garbage Green, which keeps all the trainer battles exactly the same, but reduces your access to certain Pokemon items and much more. Other ROM hacks may offer entirely new regions to explore, with fan-made original Pokemon and brand new storylines, which in themselves can come in a variety of genres, including horror-based themes and more mature content in general. Some of these more original games will keep the difficulty that standard Pokemon games are accustomed to, aka not generally all that hard, but allowing for more relaxing playthroughs of new content with a greater emphasis on the original characters and story, although some will do all this but still include the previously mentioned features of difficulty ROM hacks. A lot of these games also cater to one of the most popular forms of Pokemon gameplay, Nuzlocks. Nuzlocks are a self-imposed set of rules employed by players to make Pokemon games more difficult, with common features such as only catching one Pokemon per route, and if a Pokemon on your team faints you can no longer use it for the remainder of your run. A lot of ROM hacks are built with this formula in mind, by allowing for extra or fewer encounters, or even building an enforced Nuzlocke straight into the game. Whatever it is that you're looking for in a ROM hack, there is likely something to accommodate you, with some becoming quite famous in their own right for being amongst the very best fan-made Pokemon games ever created. I myself only started playing fan-made Pokemon games just over three years ago when I began making YouTube content, but since then, I've played a bunch of fresh, creative Pokemon games in new regions with brand new stories, as well as new takes on old classics, both in basic playthroughs and many infuriating difficulty nuzlocks. That brings us nicely to the theme of this video. In July 2020, a brand new ROM hack appeared online called Radical Red. As a note, while I'll be talking all about the game and its features, when it comes to discussing difficulty, I will mostly be coming from the perspective of playing with the Nuzlocke rule set, although a lot of what I will say will be just as applicable for casual runs. Now, hacks set in Kanto from the Fire Red base ROM are probably most common of all, which can be a positive or a negative in itself. On the plus side, you appeal to perhaps the largest number of fans, with many enjoying the familiarity and nostalgia of the original region and trainers, as well as those that just prefer the charm of the classic 2D art style for sprites, as opposed to the more modern 3D models. On the other hand, many players have played through Kanto so many times that they've just lost interest in the region altogether. Something that did help set Radical Red apart, and not just another Fire Red remake, was its use of the CFRU. Now, full disclaimer, I don't know the foggiest thing about the intricate art of how to make your own ROM hack, but a post on the Poker Community website from October 2019 sums it up. This project is a massive engine upgrade for Pokemon Fire Red. It includes an updated battle engine on par with the current generations, including every single attack, ability, item, AI, and more. In fact, this is the only game engine in Gen 3 with every single move animation. In addition, it includes several game improvement features such as expanded PC boxes, a dex nav, dynamic overworld palettes, character customization, TMHM expansion, a battle frontier, and many others. This engine has also been used for the fan acclaimed games such as Pokemon Saffron, Pokemon GS Chronicles, and Pokemon Unbound. Radical Red released already with a lot of hype behind it, and that hype seemed to be warranted, as before long the Pokemon community was ablaze with praise for the ROM hack that I personally think will go on to set the standard for many fan games to come. Radical Red was, and still is, a hot topic of discourse on the internet, with its Discord, Reddit, and popular forums such as the aforementioned Poker Community, all frequently active with members constantly sharing new strategies, showing off their Hall of Fame teams, and just plain asking for help. 
This game has also been picked up by a variety of some of the most well-known Pokemon streamers and content creators on the internet, with most highly complimenting and clearly loving the game. Well, most of the time. Now, second disclaimer, I have put a lot of hours into Radical Red. Probably more than I've put into any Pokemon game ever. And I'm going to save a lot of you some time and give you the bottom line right now. Yes, I do think that Radical Red is all that good. I first picked up and started streaming the game a couple of months after its original release, and I have attempted many runs of every update it's had since, including a Soul Link version with fellow content creator Tommy Lou. I am absolutely addicted to it, it's a topic of much teasing on my channel, and while I've had to take a couple of breaks due to an overwhelming amount of salt, I inevitably keep coming back to it. Partly because, yes, I still haven't finished a full Nuzlocke of it, alright? I'm currently on run 35. Yes, you heard that right, 35. I've had a couple of lost save data issues and a lot of bad RNG, but I also made a lot of mistakes. This game has been a huge learning curve for me as a Nuzlocker, and that's something I'll talk about more in the video as one of the reasons I like this game so much. But I have seen the game in its entirety, both through my own casual playthroughs and watching some of my own favourite Poketubers take on the challenge. So, while admittedly I'm no Pokemon challenges when it comes to Nuzlocke, I feel pretty well informed and researched on Radical Red. So what actually is Radical Red? Let's first focus on what's the same from the original Fire Red game. And here's your warning, as I talk about the game, there will be spoilers. So if you don't want to know anything at all, this would be a good time to pause the video, go play the game, and then come back and see if you agree with what I have to say. Alright, you unpause the video, that must mean you had a go at Radical Red and you're either five seconds away from typing skill issue, or you're about to throw your emulator out the window. So let's talk. This would be considered a difficulty ROM hack, with very little of the original main story being changed, bar an extra pretty cool Team Rocket event in Cerulean Cave where Giovanni catches and then battles you with a Mewtwo. Other than that, your MO remains the same, catch and raise Pokemon to take on and defeat 8 gym leaders and then the Elite Four and Pokemon Champion to become the greatest trainer of all time, all while being a good citizen by delivering mail for a Pokedex, reversing horrifying experiments gone wrong for a ticket to a boat party, Curing seasickness by rubbing a sea captain's back in exchange for the ability to cut down wildlife. Taking a minute out of your day to listen to a man that just wants to talk about his favourite Pokemon in exchange for a bike voucher. And acquiring technology to hunt down ghosts by taking down the literal mafia. You know, the usual ten year old stuff. Sorry, getting distracted and going back for a second. Seriously, what the heck was that one about? I still can't quite believe it. They couldn't have just been like, oh no, the captain ate some bad crab cakes. Is there any medicine on the ship? And you like go and find a passenger who just happens to have some medicine and we give him that. Why am I rubbing the man's back? Are we meant to be Jesus or something? Also, if that's the case, why am I claiming, albeit free healthcare for my Pokemon when I have the power of a literal god? What's that, Pidgey? You were poisoned. Well, allow me to rub thy back and thou shall recover. Anyway. One thing worth mentioning now, an important change in battle mechanics, version 3.0 updated Freezing, being replaced by its Legends Arceus counterpart, Frostbite, which inflicts gradual damage every turn while cutting the victim's special attack by 50%, something I personally much prefer. Now let's focus on the world itself for a minute. The map and the layout of all in-game locations remain predominantly the same, but since the original release there have been a few updates with interesting changes worth noting. A floor of Mount Moon was always sealed off until the player has Rock Smash, which comes fairly late in the game, but this makes sense as it's where you will eventually find Cabalion. The same is true for Viridian Forest and Rock Tunnel to eventually encounter Virizion and Terrakion. Yes, this game has plenty of legendaries and mythicals, we'll get to that. The version 3.0 update also included post-game content, with a couple of location changes. New sections were added to pre-existing areas such as Rock Tunnel and Lavender Tower. These are home to even more legendary Pokemon featured in the game, as well as their own set of trainer battles and puzzles, including a round of Pac-Man with some Gengars. Other simple map changes are helpful for all playthroughs, but particularly cater towards Nuzlocke, allowing access to a new section of Diglett's Cave before facing Brock, as well as extra patches of grass in locations like Viridian and Pewter City. These particular changes, along with the early access to fishing, gives a lot of early game variety in places to find the vast array of Pokemon available, and are greatly appreciated by Nuzlocke as looking for extra encounters, which, trust me, you need. Your rival remains the same classic douchebag we all know and love. Key story items are obtained in their usual ways, and nearly all important NPCs and trainers from the original Fire Red game, including gym leaders and the Elite Four, remain present and where you'd expect them to be bar one, which we'll come to later. Most non-key but useful items, such as leftovers and the Master Ball, can also be found where you would expect, but there are a couple of welcome changes, with the aforementioned Old Rod and the EXP share both being gifted to you in Viridian City and Forest respectively. Besides that, 
most of the Kanto you know and love remains the same, with the changes mostly being rooted in the additions to the game, as well as the Pokemon battles themselves, which are lethal. And I'm telling you, these boss battles in particular did not come to play. The first thing I feel like I have to talk about in terms of reasons I love this game so much, and something I've already referred to, is the number of updates Radical Red has received since its initial release. Radical Red has gone from version 1.0 all the way to the current version 3.1 at time of recording, with another big update assumed to be on the way. A couple of the previous version updates have been for small changes and bug fixes, which is greatly appreciated, but a good number of them have been a substantial increase to available content and welcome additions to the game. Radical Red easily owes a good amount of its success to the commitment of the devs in keeping the game updated and fresh. As the video goes on, I won't be talking about things in the order they were released. I'll just talk about subjects as a whole and occasionally reference which version the features in question were added. Now let's talk about what's new. First of all, probably the most important, the Pokemon. At release, Radical Red had all Pokemon up to and including Gen 7, as well as Mega Evolution. This is already a very impressive pool of Pokemon available, and Megas have always been a huge fan favourite since their introduction in Pokemon X and Y. But as I said, the updates to Radical Red have been numerous, with version 2.0 coming in September of 2020, just over two months after Radical's original release, which included all Gen 8 Pokemon that were present in the original, official drop of Pokemon Sword and Shield. Although it should be noted that moves, items and abilities all the way up to Sword and Shield were already present in Radical Red since it first came out. Five months later, in February of 2021, version 2.2 was posted online, adding even more Pokemon from the Sword and Shield DLCs, but the devs went a step further, including a bunch of brand new Mega Evolutions, taking the Gen 8 Pokemon that had G-Max forms, and turning that form into its Mega Evolution for Radical Red. Very nice, guys. Very nice. July of 2022 saw version update 3.0, and the introduction of Hisuian Pokemon which debuted in Pokemon Legends Arceus, just six months after that game's official release. But again, the dev team took it a step further by introducing brand new custom forms of their own for the first time. 3.0 brought with it Sevian Pokemon, Radical Red's own twist on regional variants. Inspired by the Sevi Islands, these custom forms gave fresh designs to Pokemon from every prior gen, and I've loved using a lot of them. Shout out to Sevian Milotic. Fairy ground typing. Busted. All eight generations of Pokemon spread across Kanto allows for all areas of the region to have a large pool of mons available to add to your team as you make your way through the game. Most legendaries are understandably locked behind the post-game content, although you can still catch the legendary birds pre-Elite 4 as is traditional, along with their Galarian counterparts and the Sacred Beasts. Having this many modern Pokemon in Fire Red's classic sprite form, in Kanto, being able to see famous trainers updated teams, I've personally loved, and with an expected Gen 9 update hopefully coming sometime this year, which is sure to bring old eyes back to the game, as well as keep bringing in fresh ones, Radical Red could be set to stay relevant for many new generations to come. Along with a wide array of moves and abilities from all eight generations, Radical Red also has a fair few custom ones. Some of which are kind of funny, but many of which are really interesting and make a lot of sense for the Pokemon. Shout out to my favourite custom move, exclusive to Darkrai, Dark Hole! On top of these custom moves and abilities, many Pokemon simply gain access to pre-existing ones that suit them, with a lot of old moves and abilities receiving buffs of their own in general. I'm showing just a few examples here, but in the description there'll be a link to the Radical Red docs which lists all the changes I'm talking about and more. On top of these improvements, a lot of Pokemon's core stats have been adjusted. Some are minimal, if a Pokemon was already good, in most cases it remains good or better, with a lot of the changes being mostly rebalancing. But many less overwhelming Pokemon, at least from a competitive perspective, have seen significant stat changes, which along with the access to new moves, abilities, and for some, new typings, helps make so many more Pokemon competitively viable and fun to use for your playthrough. In respect to battle items, pretty much every useful one up to Gen 8 has been available since the game released, some of which have been tweaked slightly to make them more useful. For key items, Radical Red includes the Dex Nav, making it far easier to track specific Pokemon with better stats, hidden abilities, and egg moves. Also, version 2.0 introduced the Poker Rider, awarded to you when you beat your rival in Cerulean City, allowing you to fly to any previous location. The 3.0 post-game content also showed some love to the Sun and Moon era by introducing Z-moves, with most of the crystals being obtainable by battling, or just from having a chat with the right NPC. Concerning original items, there aren't too many, but the ones we have are significant. 
Firstly, link cables, which if you're like me and old enough to remember having physically used one of these in the past, let me know in the comments. In Radical Red, the link cable accessible once you get to Celadon Mart will allow many Pokemon that would ordinarily evolve by trading to instead do so at the drop of a cable. Many other Pokemon that would normally evolve in unique ways can instead do so via other evolution items, which are again pretty much all found in Celadon Mart, but can be picked up in the overworld too. However, worth mentioning while talking about evolution, there are still a couple which you'll have to put some work in to obtain. For example, Tyrogue will still need equal attack and defense stats at level 20 to turn into Hitmontop. Some evolutions will only happen at certain times of day. Friendship Evos are still a thing, but the game does provide access to berries to speed up this process. And there are still move dependent evolutions, such as Ambipom needing to know double hit. Going back to original items, 3.0 also brought with it four more important ones worth mentioning. They're technically considered skills and kind of come more under quality of life improvements, which again, we'll get to later, but I think these are worth mentioning now while discussing items. Firstly, the day night changer. Yes, it turns out that Professor Oak's aide is a big God of War fan, summoning Skull and Hattie to swap between the two at will. Useful for finding or evolving Pokemon exclusive to day or night. Sorry, I just really wanted to get a God of War reference in here. That's a good game, right? <laughs> Secondly, the least original but still appreciated is an auto run feature gifted by mum at the start of the game. Next, the infinite repel gifted to you very early on. This does exactly what it says on the tin and made me the happiest I've been since I first saw this text. You're goddamn right. Although I've lost count the number of times I've forgotten about it and wonder why no encounters were showing up. Oh, my infinite repels on my fall of it. So, another encounter is gonna be. Is my infinite repel on? Disabled. Okay, there we go. So, we get two encounters here. What have you got for my infinite repel on? Yes, it is. The last original item or skill is an absolute game changer the Poker Vial. Locked behind a unique battle puzzle in Viridian City where you take on six level 100 Sheninjas with a rental team of level 5s, your prize, the Poker Vial. Usable right from the menu, allows you the full privileges of a Pokemon Center. You can use it up to six times before it needs to be recharged by, you guessed it, visiting a Pokemon Center. Poor Nurse Joy, the latest victim of unemployment just because a machine can do it better. The next addition to talk about, and one of my favourite features of the game, although admittedly they all end up setting off my anxiety because of how difficult some of them can be, are the additional boss battles. Boss battles are one of the best features of all video games, right? Dramatic build-ups to epic encounters against worthy foes that really make you think and push you to your breaking point. Well, this ain't no three-day sniper fight with an old man that's also a plant, but Radical Red sure does do it well. Now, all the fights that you would expect from Vanilla Fire Red, Gym Leaders, Elite Four, Giovanni, Rival Battles, all are considered bosses in Radical Red. But this ROM hack comes with a whole bunch of extra ones. Most have very little to do with changing the game's core story, with the possible exception of Rocket Admins Archer and Ariana, who crop up in most places you encounter Team Rocket, but don't really influence the narrative much besides during the Team Rocket Cerulean Cave event I mentioned. There are multiple enforced fights against them during your run, with one particular double battle being a common run-ender for Nuzlocks, when you partner with another character addition to the game, and someone else who will crop up for boss battles from time to time, Gen 3's very own Brendan. I hate Brendan. I hate Brendan because in a previous version of the game, the second rival fight with Brendan would trigger if you step too far on this path, which I did a lot. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. No! Even if you aren't ready, which I wasn't, a lot. Cause how the hell was I supposed to know? I just wanted my Route 11 encounter and then I still kept doing it even after I knew, cause you know, speed up. But oh my God, I hate Brandon. 
Most people also hate him because he's a notorious douchebag when you partner with him in the aforementioned double battle against the Giovanni fan club, as he radiates that felt cute, might help my partner pick up a dub, might throw the run, dunno energy. May also makes an appearance when you go to Cenebra Island, which is pretty cool, until you see that team, oh my god, what the hell is going on here? Another big addition to cool boss fights is the appearance of all Johto gym leaders. Most are optional, with only Faulkner and Claire being compulsory, the first being necessary to unlock Pewter Gym, and Claire replacing Giovanni as the 8th gym leader. But don't worry, this time she doesn't get tilted and force you to go on a side quest before giving you your badge. All the other Johto leaders are found scattered throughout the Kanto region, and provide a lot of incentive to take them on, as defeating them will award a lot of unique, useful items that cannot be obtained in any other way. They also differ from all other compulsory boss fights, as the Pokemon will scale to your level. So no just skipping Bugsy and coming back later expecting to just outlevel him. Other optional bosses include rematches. Some of the Johto leaders can be fought again during the post game, offering even more incentives for victory in the forms of Z moves, more items, and opportunities to catch rare Pokemon. Some Kanto gym leader rematches, however, can be done well before the Elite Four. They will have more challenging teams, but give you some great prizes for picking up that second dub. Gym leader rematches have always been a favourite feature of mine, in the limited amount of official Pokemon games that actually give you that option. So being able to do so against most of this game's gym leaders is a big tick in my book. And just the addition of extra boss fights against characters not typically in Fire Red is pretty awesome. Now before we can talk about the game's difficulty, we should preface it by discussing the customization features available in the game. At launch, there were none. But just two months later, we got version 2.0, which came with a built-in randomizer. Not a unique feature to Radical Red, but still a pretty rare one for an optional randomizer to be built into the ROM hack itself. Notably, this randomizer would mix up wild Pokemon and most trainers, but all boss battles keep their set teams to help ensure their difficulty. Nine months later, version 2.3 added minimal grinding mode, which is more a quality of life feature in my opinion, as it sets all wild and trainer Pokemon to max IVs and zero EVs, with no way of changing them. Other than a dude in Saffron who will lower your speed IV for stuff like Trick Room. This is a huge deal because before this mode was available, or if you choose not to use it, bosses are all the more tougher, with all of their Pokemon having max IVs, and from the start of the game, they will have some EV investment in the most logical stats, but by the time you get to Erika, every single boss Pokemon will have made the most of its full 510 EVs and be built to perfection. Now, there are items and methods to help with IV EV training. You can find the stat-specific items like the Power Belt, which becomes obtainable after you receive Cut, but all the others aren't accessible until you have Surf, meaning you'll be playing the game a fair bit before you can make the most of them. Unfortunately, the Macho Brace is also only available post-Surf. But, once you get to Lavender Town, and if you've got the cash, there's a gent who will let you slay endless armies of Ordino for experience, as well as teams built specifically to help you EV train in different stats. There's also an NPC in Celadon who will max your Pokemon's IVs for a small fortune. Plus, you can just use the Dex Nav to hunt for the Mon with the stats you want, but all this is time consuming and not really what I play Pokemon for. Many may disagree, and more power to you. That's the great thing about it being customizable. If you want to hunt the perfect IV Mon and properly EV train it and then reset its EVs to then train different EVs for a different battle over and over again, you do you, my friend. You do you. The 2.3 update also added easy and hardcore mode on top of the default difficulty available since launch. Version 3.0 came with further customization to the randomizer, allowing you to ensure that randomized encounters are scaled to an appropriate power level for that part of the game. Now, all my experience playing Radical Red has been on the standard difficulty, and since it was added, I've always played on minimal grinding mode, which, again, I think of more of as a time saver, but admittedly, it does influence the core difficulty to a degree, due to all boss battles having perfect EV and IV spreads for their Pokemon. And if you're in a Nuzlocke, your first capture of any given route being a Pokemon Pokemon with the optimal IVs is unlikely, already putting you on the back foot. Yes, you can still EV train your team the way you want it, the old fashioned way, but you don't get access to ways to reset your EVs and match your IVs for a fair amount of the game. So yes, it does make a difference beyond just time, and even more so in a Nuzlocke. But like I said, most of my experience has been without worrying about EVs and IVs, so I won't be mentioning them much again. Likewise, I have watched other people's playthroughs of easy and hardcore mode, which I may reference occasionally, but it isn't the bulk of my own experience. Lastly, I know there will be some people watching who will disagree fundamentally with Radical Red being difficult in the slightest. And to those people I say, fair enough. 
So how does Radical Red make the game difficult? First off, a rule often self-implemented by players looking for a greater challenge, level caps. There are maximum level caps between many of the major boss fights, which do get pretty high. These ensure that for the most part, you are on par or perhaps a level over each of their Pokemon and not just steamrolling them from a higher level. There are two more notable features for the default difficulty. First, Set Mode, which takes away the opportunity for a player to preemptively swap their Pokemon with the knowledge of what their opponent is about to send out. Secondly, another staple of hardcore Nuzlocks, the game removes the option to use items in battle during boss fights. So say goodbye to heal spamming your way through problems. Next, every trainer in the game has had a significant update to their team to make them tougher, with the bosses in particular handcrafted to give you hell in battle. Your rivals have mixed teams, as you would expect. Giovanni you fight three times, one of which he does have a sand team to match his typical ground typing, along with a couple of mons that suit his character, but again, his team is generally pretty mixed, with the final double battle including a Tapu Lele and the aforementioned Mewtwo. Gym leaders and Elite Four focus on their expected monotype for the most part, with one or two variables that make sense. For example, Brock has a Vulpix, Aww. and Bruno has a Zacian, what the fuck? Bosses also take advantage of regional variants and updated typings to assist their monotype. And then you have Sabrina, who has a grand total of three psychic Pokemon, instead focusing on a full-out Trick Room team, which still gives me nightmares. And Koga, with only two poison types, instead focusing on a speed team as a tribute to his favourite blue hedgehog. All bosses' teams are built to handle all the typical counters with a variety of types, as well as Wi-Fi battle-worthy movesets, including moves they would get through breeding and TMs. They have hidden abilities, optimal natures, and beneficial, sometimes outright OP, held items. He's looking at you, Koga, with your triple life orb, choice specs, and scarf. My man's got a better inventory than this dude from Resident Evil 2. What are you buying? If that wasn't enough, from the moment you get to Lieutenant Surge, nearly all the boss battles have Megas. You yourself get access to the Mega Ring after taking down Giovanni in Silphco, by which point you can have accumulated a fair few of the Mega Stones, with more available to find or win as you continue through the story. What's more, I've mentioned Giovanni having Mewtwo and Bruno having Zacian, but all of the Elite Four and Champion all have multiple Legendaries and Mythicals. On top of great teams, the bosses are controlled by a far more intelligent AI. All trainers and wild Pokemon benefit from this, but bosses in particular will make far more switches to counter your own choices, knowing when they have a potential kill or the chance to be killed, and choosing their moves and swaps accordingly. However, this better play isn't always as readable and therefore easy to predict as you would hope. As I've seen and experienced many occasions where the AI has made extremely random choices. For example, in the first battle with Giovanni, he opens with Nidoking. Now, in a previous run, I opened with Alakazam, who outspeeds and one-shots with Psychic, and he immediately swapped to his Dark-type Honchkrow in the back. Fair enough. In this run, remembering this, I lead with Azelf, who also outspeeds and one-shots, and assuming he's going to swap, I turn one swap to Gollum so I can get up Stealth Rocks, which are good for the Focus Sash Infinape, as well as to tank hits and kill the Honchkrow. But, in this situation, he stays in and clicks Sludge Bomb, now maybe you're thinking, well, maybe it was more to do with the damage output Nidoking can do to Azelf over the Alakazam before. Well, from the damage calcs, Sludge Bomb to Azelf does a max of 51.4%, whereas versus Alakazam, Sludge Bomb and Earth Power do a max of 52%. Plus the Azelf is the one immune to its stab Earth Power, so nope, I don't think that's it. Furthermore, in this situation, Earth Power always one-shots Gollum. I go back to Azelf, and he clicks Ice Beam which, yes, would have done a substantial 78 to 93% to Gollum and potentially killed after the Sludge Bomb chip, but Earth Power always kills. And you could say, okay, well, maybe it's because you've revealed a mom with Levitate and the AI is just being safe. But that sort of reasoning doesn't usually stop the AI for going for one-shots when it sees them. Yes, if you're already at about, say, 10%, it will use one of its random moves it has as opposed to the highest damaging one, as long as it still kills, to play around your swap. But again, in this situation, Ice Beam isn't a sure kill. I'm sure there is some logic to this which someone in the comments might point out, and fair enough, but this is just one example. I've seen and experienced many more battles where the AI will make bizarre choices, not in keeping with the choices they made in prior similar situations. If you've played Radical Red, what's the strangest thing you've seen the AI do? Let me know in the comments. I don't know the first thing about how the AI is programmed, but I kind of like to think that the sometimes random choices are the creator's way of having the game make reads and try to outplay you, as well as making it slightly less predictable at least some of the time. Unfortunately, even when you can predict the AI to a degree, that doesn't always mean you can do anything about it. 
These battles start tricky and become ridiculous to try to win. In Nuzlocke, I've had my run end courtesy of nearly all the bosses at least once. But while infuriating at times, I keep coming back. The satisfaction of crafting out a team and planning out a strategy to take on these fights, sometimes for up to an hour, and having things work out the way you hope is very satisfying. Along with all these extra boss battles, there are also a collection of mini-bosses scattered throughout the region. Some are minor story-relevant NPCs like the Fossil Maniac and the Team Rocket member at the end of Nugget Bridge, who I've lost to more than anyone else by the way, but there are also some randomly placed ones to catch you off guard. They don't quite make as many swaps as main bosses do, but their teams are far stronger than the average trainer, getting scarier as you progress. A quick highlight to this trainer, who used to have an average team and be avoidable, but became a mini-boss sent deliberately to mess with me. Also, a special mention to the paths to Fuchsia City, which have multiple mini-bosses armed with teams built to take advantage of the weather conditions that accompany the paths, with some mega evolutions for good measure. The last battle, which could be considered a mini-boss, is the Marowak in Lavender Tower, which, for a start, is a Lolan, a simple but nice touch, but in a Lolan style, it gets an instant omni-boost and has one of the most broken abilities I've ever seen, rocking a big old bone and a diverse moveset to boot. Also, interestingly, it's the only battle in the default difficulty where the opponent is over your level cap. All of these features, along with the increased pool of Pokemon and how they can be built, make the trainer battles far more intimidating. Even the basic trainers can catch you off guard with a mon that you aren't prepared for, threatening to wipe your team on the spot. But the gratification of crafting out the perfect team and making all the right decisions to make your way through every single gruelling battle and finally, eventually, become the champion is something I wouldn't know because I keep bloody losing, but, uh, I, I, I bet it's pretty cool. While I don't doubt there will be many who don't find Radical Red all that hard and will instead champion games like Emerald Kaizo, and that's great. I'm not trying to say that Rad Red is the hardest. I've done a lot better in this than I have done in games like Blaze Black 2 Redux, although I would argue, and I may lose some of you here, that the Rad Red features I've mentioned so far, and a few still to talk about, allow you to implement the most skill by giving you multiple resources to more surgically craft your team. Either way, I'd still say that a good amount of you watching would agree that it's still a damn difficult game that will test your skill and patience. And if you're anything like me, keep bringing you back for more. To talk about hardcore mode a little bit, the game makes things even harder by making opposing teams even more powerful, with more Pokemon, which are closer to your level cap, and carrying an even wider range of useful moves, items, and abilities for coverage. Bosses in particular are also aided by permanent weather conditions to further help their strategies. Also, while in default mode, legendaries are exclusive to Giovanni and the Pokemon League, but in hardcore mode, pretty much every main boss after Badge 4 will also have them. As a final slap in the face, hardcore mode locks you, the player, out of certain moves and abilities. This isn't even the full list, just as many of the notable ones I could fit on the screen, but the full list includes every single setup move, including Harden. Poor Metapod, bro. This mode is not for the vain-hearted. Coming towards the end of our video, let's finish by talking about some of the other extra features and quality of life changes. I already mentioned a few things that could come under this topic, such as the skills like Infinite Repel and the Poker Vial. Another big one, HMs do not require you to teach them to a Pokemon to then use. Yes, you still have to acquire Cut, Surf, Strength, etc. But as soon as you have the HM, you can freely use the hidden machine without the need for any specific Pokemon to know the move. I mentioned earlier that all Pokemon that usually evolve by more unique means instead evolve by a stone or item such as a link cable. All of these evolution items can be purchased in Celadon City Mart, along with most types of Pokeballs, in addition to all the usual items you would expect to find there in the vanilla game. Celadon is also home to a bunch of the game's extra static Pokemon opportunities. As usual, you can grab an Eevee from here, but this house is the Cave of Wonders of Pokemon games, with all of its inhabitants sharing one common goal. Shards. That's right, the different coloured shards you've been picking up so far can all be traded for nearly every single fossil Pokemon, an endless selection of eggs all containing starter Pokemon, and this guy who will give you one of the seven different types of Pikachu in the game at random. Furthermore, the Game Corner prize counter, once the only way to obtain a Porygon, is now your go-to place for nearly every single pseudo-legendary's basic Pokemon, and even more cool ones. If you've got the extra Poker Dollars, they'll all come in their shiny forms with hidden abilities. Worth mentioning now, uh, What the f <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, the coin case has been completely removed, meaning you can get all of these Pokemon, along with a generous pool of strong TMs, or just plain gamble, right out of your own wallet. 
Lastly for Celadon, after beating Erika, you will be gifted an egg which will always hatch into a Sevian Pokemon. Other traditional static, such as Snorlax and the legendary birds, can be found where you'd expect. This dude will sell you a Magikarp, and an extra shiny one too if you've got the cash. This dude will give you a Lapras, and you can win a fighting Pokemon by beating the optional fighting dojo, now led by Johto's Chuck, although the prize Pokemon have been changed. As standard, there are a bunch of available trades scattered around, which can actually get you some fairly interesting mons. But as seems to be the theme with Radical Red, there's more. Pewter, Cerulean and Vermilion will all offer you a Pokemon egg for 5k, and other trainers will also offer you gift Pokemon through winning important battles, as well as optional rematches. Hisuian Pokemon, unfortunately, can't be caught in the wild until after reaching the post game. However, the 5k eggs I just mentioned always come with an option to be a guaranteed hatch into a Hisuian Pokemon. Also, by taking a Pokemon that has a potential Hisuian evolution to this man in Saffron City, he will allow it to then evolve into its Hisuian counterpart. This can only be done once, but another guy in the post game on Sevi Islands will do more. If all this wasn't enough, Radical Red also features Raid Dens. Introduced in Sword and Shield, and still a major theme of Scarlet and Violet, Raid Dens can be found all over the Kanto region, allowing you to pair up with a random NPC and take three of your own Pokemon into battle against various Dynamaxed Pokemon. Defeat them, and you will have one opportunity to catch them, or they'll fade away. Dens will reset themselves after some time passes, or you can use a wishing piece to do so manually. These can be obtained as part of the prize pool for beating Dens, either by catching or knocking out the Pokemon, along with a selection of other cool goodies. Lastly, when you set out to start your journey, your mum will ask you which region you would like to choose your starter from, offering all the way through to Gen 8. With access to so many good Pokemon, you'll next want to make them as powerful as possible, and there are a lot of features to help with this. If you aren't on minimal grinding mode, I've already mentioned some of the features that can help you with your EV IV crafting, so we'll skip that stuff. But I did mention the nerds in Saffron City that can help you reset EVs and IVs. All of these nerds are extremely helpful, you'll find yourself visiting them a lot. This one being an utter chad by helping to switch your Pokemon's abilities to their hidden ones, and for a mere bottle cap, which you can find scattered around the region. There's also this guy who will sell you a bunch of standard berries and ability pills, which allow you to swap between Pokemon's regular abilities if they have multiple. This one will swap what type of Pokeball your Mon is in, and this chap will allow you to choose what type of hidden power your Pokemon will use. Next up, Pokemon Natures, one of the most important ways of maximising a Pokemon's potential in a specific stat, can all be changed for free at every single Pokemon Centre in the game. This is one of my top features and something I think should be a staple for all Pokemon ROM hacks, along with the Pokevile. Moving on to moves. Once you reach Cerulean City, you'll be able to take on another of the game's battle puzzles. Victory awards you the option to teach all Pokemon all of their previous moves right from the menu whenever you want. Egg moves can be accessed in a similar way once you reach Fuchsia City, as defeating this guy in another of the game's mini battle puzzles will let you teach any Pokemon their egg moves for free. You'll also meet many move tutors with some very tempting offering- Whoa. Whoa. Especially this guy, with a monster inventory, although he's less kind because he charges you. Regarding TMs, as is the way in most Pokemon games since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they are all multi-time use, and there's a vast pool available which has been updated over time and currently numbers 120 moves from various generations. Radical Red gives you a decent number of these TMs through natural game progression, either by finding them on the floor or beating gym leaders. Some, like Earthquake and Stealth Rock, still come much later in the game, but you still get access to a lot of good ones by mid-game, and as I mentioned before, the Celadon Prize Corner offers an OP list. Now for items. You can find all the usual items that you can also buy, like balls and potions, scattered throughout the region and gifted to you by NPCs. Berries can also be purchased from the aforementioned nerd, with rarer ones appearing in the prize pool for defeating raid dens. Regarding other useful held items for battle, the game will give you some for free. You can get the muscle band and the wise glasses before Cerulean City, and later games sees you finding stuff like the scope lens and heavy duty boots. Also, having a rock, steel or ground type Pokemon with you while traversing Rock Tunnel gets you the safety goggles. Some of the more powerful TMs and items, however, will come at the price of a battle, either against Johto Gym Leaders or some Kanto Gym Leader rematches. 
As I mentioned before, these boss battles are difficult and it's very tempting to skip the optional ones, but if you really want some of the game's top tier items, you're gonna have to earn them. A couple of the bosses, however, will give you stuff just for showing off a Pokemon with a specific high stat. Some will also give you a Mega Stone for their signature Pokemon via these methods. Others can also be picked up all over the overworld, as well as gifted for free by other NPCs. This house specifically will give you a Mega Stone for most starters by showing them the corresponding Pokemon. On top of all this, some items can only be obtained by thieving them from or catching wild Pokemon, another use for the Dex Nav, great for encountering a specific Mon. To round off talking about the extra features, I said that the game's traditional Fire Red story doesn't change too much, but there are a few cool post-game side quests that involve a little bit of extra story, specifically a great scene between Mew and Mewtwo. And before Erica will give you a rematch, she sends you to Fuchsia City to get some medicine for her poorly gloom, which, yes, is a legit copy-paste of the Ampharos story from Gold Silver, but still, I like little touches like this. Another nice touch is a little bit of growth from our Johto Gym leaders. Nothing too dramatic. Pokemon games aren't often remembered for their groundbreaking stories. Professor, where's Stoutland? I'm sorry. Alright, I said they weren't groundbreaking, not that they didn't affect me. But, yes. A little bit of character development from some of them. Whitney references her prior breakdown for losing and how she's come a long way since then. Claire kind of does the same, talking about how she spent a long time blaming the introduction of the fairy type for her downfall, but realising it was just her bad work ethic and mentality bringing her down. Yeah, again, nothing hugely significant, but nice additions that I appreciated. We've already talked about some of the great quality of life improvements the game offers, such as minimal grinding mode, infinite repel and the poker vial but there's a whole load more that have come through various updates. Another favourite of mine, which came in version 3.0, was the PC being accessible right from your menu. Some others include a prompt to automatically put a Pokemon's held item straight into your inventory after you catch it. You can automatically see which of your Pokemon are move compatible straight from the TM case. You can re-nickname Pokemon from the menu. You can arrange your bag by name, type or amount. You get a scanner to track happiness, stats and how many steps are left for an egg to hatch. An info bar which you can check mid-battle to track turns left for things like weather, trick room or screens. And to see how many Pokemon your opponent has left, along with what they are, if they've been revealed. There's an in-battle shortcut which defaults to the best type of Pokeball you should use to catch the Pokemon in front of you, and a berry or any single-use held item like the Focus Sash, if consumed in a trainer battle, will reset back onto your Pokemon at the end of the battle. And the list goes on. Worth mentioning now, associated to quality of life changes, is cheating. For those that want to get their set of Kyber on and screw the rules, there's my Yu-Gi-Oh reference, there is an easily available list of cheat codes which you can input to your emulator and gen any item or TM you want straight into your PC. But slightly fairer perhaps are the in-game cheat codes. Once again, you can channel your inner million dollar douchebag and pick up that enemy controller for the SNES at your home in Pallet Town and input three different cheat codes. Dex All, which allows you to track any Pokemon in a given area through your Dex Nav without first having encountered it. We have SO2 Toxic, which is the care package cheat. Activating this will make it so that one of Oak's aides will track you down at set points in the game and gift you a whole bunch of items. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will give you care packages. These items are reasonable for where you are in the game and include things that you could have obtained by thieving from wild Pokemon up to that point. Meaning you're just getting stuff that the game offers for free just without grinding for it. You get a ton of bottle caps this way, used for swapping hidden abilities in Saffron City, which you'll definitely want to use a lot. So yeah, care packages are a big tick from me. And Warrior Op, which will force this youngster to give you infinite rare candies. Great for those like myself that don't enjoy grinding for levels and just want to focus on the battles. This is also essentially an infinite money cheat, meaning you won't have to worry about all the Pokemon and items that are locked behind your wallet. Radical Red also included one of the most popular features from a Pokemon game of all time. You've already seen clips of it, following Pokemon. Not all, but nearly every single Pokemon in the game can follow you about from the moment you reach Pewter City. 
At this point, I am just gushing, but you just have to admire the amount of thought that's gone into the customization and improvement of quality to life in general. And again, the fact that all of this is in fire red just makes it feel all the more impressive. So popular the game has become that there are a few very well put together websites which document all the information that you might want to know about the ROM hack, and even a dedicated radical red damage calculator and a rad red version of Pokemon Showdown. That's pretty much everything I have to talk about concerning the features of Radical Red. It's a lot, with a whole bunch more that I haven't even mentioned. And again, with how good the updates have been and how popular the game is, I see plenty more being added in the future. Gen 9 appears to be on the horizon, and I can only imagine a following update will add something related to the terrestrializing mechanic. After that, who knows? I would definitely love to see them add some more optional trainers from other Pokemon games, and perhaps some more side story events. I could do a whole other video on little ways I'd incorporate other famous trainers. For now, I'll just mention a couple. N, just chilling in Lavender Tower, is a whole ass mood. Or he could have heard about the Marowak and wanted to help, and he's impressed that you dealt with it and says he's off to Cerulean Cave. Something is calling to him from there. Then when you go there, Getsus is there with Kyrium and you battle him. Cyrus and Team Platinum could take over Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar Island. And one I definitely do is once you've triggered all other mini story scenes, the next time you go to the Nerd's house for one of its many purposes, in a throwback to Black and White 2, Cynthia is there and immediately battles you. I'm getting carried away now, but you get the point. All that said, there may also come a point where the devs decide to give another generation of Pokemon the same treatment. Maybe updating Gen 5 to include all modern Pokemon, along with extra gym leaders from Gen 4, and then chuck Guzma and Team Skull in there. Who knows, maybe Radical Red will be it, and they'll update it as long as they want to and then move away from Pokemon altogether. Either way, Pokemon Radical Red, for me, is the greatest Pokemon game ever made. They took the best parts of every Pokemon game and threw them all together with a bunch of extras, and making it difficult on top just makes the whole thing more rewarding to play through. It has made me a better Nuzlocker. Every playthrough I learnt a little more, did a little better, and eventually, I will defeat Radical Red. And that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have you played Radical Red? Did you enjoy it? Is Radical Red really all that good? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you did enjoy the video, do please hit the like button. This took a long time to put together and a lot of thought and passion has gone into it. So I'd majorly appreciate the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, or even tune into me nuzlocking and hopefully eventually beating Radical Red, consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, we're all mad here.